Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Innovation Conversation. Today we are joined by Enmol Goyel. Enmol, welcome. Thanks for having me, Ricardo. I really appreciate you. Right, it's a pleasure having you here. Enmol, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in a few words, I am uh, the owner of Gax Limited, which is a tech venture builder. And our aim is to support startups from early stage all the way up to scaling stage um, in more uh, sort of venture terminology from early seed stage to series B, helping them with their development, uh, their scale up. So working with them on their sales and um, as well as focusing on their fundraising journey. And I know you're quite a traveler, right? Because you have been to multiple countries, you go on uh, multiple events as a speaker as well. So how, how did that whole thing came about? Interestingly enough, um, you know, so, so all the sort of the traveling journeys they've picked up since March. Um, and and mm -hmm. that sort of was like my first uh, big event in Ibiza. So people always you know recently a lot of my friends have been noticing as well and they're like wow you know overnight you've traveled out to you know seven eight locations but it's a funny story that no one saw that for you know the last 18 months that mm -hmm. i was you know doing all the work in i was putting out all the posts i was doing um all the sort of the groundwork and then now or, you know all of a sudden it's that overnight success so uh, it always makes me chuckle but no um yeah i tend to travel out for any sort of events where there's need to sort of speak regarding startups, regarding innovation, regarding acceleration programs. The first one uh, in Ibiza that happened in March was the Ibiza Tech Forum. And the the founder of the, the uh, forum, he reached out to me because I would put out a lot of content regarding startups in terms of how they can reach to investors, how they can, you know, effectively work on their product market fit, work on sort of their market journey and then scale up. And he saw that I was providing a lot of value and he thought, you know, I should be an individual who should come and speak at the event, luckily. Um, and from there, you know, I met some of the other guys in the Spanish ecosystem. And then, you know, some of the London guys saw um, that I was speaking at events in Spain and were like, hey, you know, we know you're from London and you've been going to Spain, so you might as well come speak in London. Okay. Um, and then from there, you know, I sort of catapulted um speaking at a few more spanish uh, locations and now been asked to you know next sort of come to a few latin um countries as well do you speak spanish or not really i can i can speak spanish yeah i, I wouldn't say i'm fluent but i would say i'm 80 90 percent you know I, I i can pretty much understand everything mm -hmm. uh sometimes speaking uh, I'll, I'll 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 be a bit hesitant when it's you know the thing with spanish is it's quite complicated sometimes you know when you have to mix conditional with past preterite and all those sort of <laughs> things so when it gets super super complicated uh i'm sometimes like okay well what was the tense i need to sort of figure out in my head but i can i can pretty much understand everything okay so this, this is actually quite interesting so what do you think are the key differences between these two the ecosystems between the spanish one and the uk one for example yeah yeah, I think the Spanish ecosystem is a lot more risk averse, uh, which I guess, in in my opinion, I quite like. So I've you know recently, mm -hmm. uh, you know, been part of a couple uh, syndicates and sort of you know we'll be opening our own fund, um, and and I'm starting to look things more from a investors investors perspective as well as um, sort of a venture builders perspective, and from an investor side, having as much traction and data behind is a good thing. So the the, the one big thing is obviously that the Spanish investors don't like to take as much risk. But then on the other hand, then you see lack of innovation there. Um, you know, you see London as a big sort of tech hub in terms of what's up and coming here, especially, you know, in the fintech uh, market, in the sort of blockchain market, um, and overall sort of AI developments that are happening within London. Um, you know, in the big sort of hubs, which I would say is either Madrid or Barcelona, that that's where most of the innovations happen in Spain, they're still quite lagging just because mm -hmm. the infrastructure and the risk appetite isn't there. But if you're a early stage investor and you want to invest in a startup, you'll get a much fairer valuation uh, being in the Spanish economy compared to the London economy. You know, you think it's hard to get started in, it's harder to get started in Spain compared to the UK overall? Um, that's an interesting question. See, I guess in terms of starting out, you can, you can start off in either markets. The, the biggest mm -hmm. issue with any startup is when they're starting out, they need to know, they need to address what problem they're solving. So it doesn't really matter where you start. It's more in terms of applicability. Um, I can start the same product in both economies, but I need to know who I'm targeting and what price I'm going into the market with and, you know, what my overall sort of landing strategy is. 
So I think that's a bit more important uh, in either economies. Maybe I will say there are a few more incentives uh, in London to sort of push people to go into that um, entrepreneurial sort of journey and, you know, figure out the ins and outs of it and, you know, the overall support system slightly bigger in terms of the events that will happen um, and the programs that are available. But I wouldn't say there's a massive difference if you want to get started in either economies. First on one thing, how did you get started in the whole this, you know, what was your introduction to the, the startup ecosystem like? Yeah, so mine was actually uh, a, a I, I, you know, I know people always say I, I didn't mean to go here and I just landed in it. And it's a very cliche mm -hmm. statement, but it genuinely, truly is in my case. And um, so my background, my, my education background is in maths economics. I was a valedictorian at the University of Liverpool studying there. And um, I, I'd done sort of uh, placements at Marsh McLennan uh, in sort of terms of data analytics. And um, I think I'd just done short stint at JP Morgan in their M&A division, realized I didn't really want to go into IB. And I was coming back to uh, Marsh, uh, Marsh McLennan within Marsh Division, um, sort of coming back into the data um, and insurance role. And whilst I was doing that, I decided to take a couple months out and travel to South America. And whilst I was doing that, I, I think you know what Reddit is, right? The, the uh, platform. Yep. Yeah. So I was on Reddit and I came across this guy's post on Reddit, you know, some sort of e-commerce post asking about, Look, you know, um, I need help. I'm setting up a new uh, store and, you know, new company and it'll be selling jewelry. But I have this, this and this tech side of things and I'm unsure about how to price. I'm unsure about, you know, how to market. I'm unsure about sort of validation and a few other points. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm just sitting in my hotel and I was like, yo, I, actually, I know these answers, you know, from studies, from application, um, you know, in, in sort of the small stints of work that I'd done at that time. And I was like, OK, cool. Well, you know, I, I'll write out a response. And, you know, I broke it down. I said, look, if you're considering price, you need to look at competitors. You need to look at the market and mm. supply chain, product market fit. You probably need to do, you know, maybe friends and family and then in around, you know, see what uh, the response is and a few other points regarding sort of marketing with low budget. And he said, wow, thank you. And, you know, he went away, came back after a week and said, look, you know, I applied all the sort of the things you said and it was really, really helpful, got really good data. Um, can we get on a call next week and, uh, you know, discuss? I would love to sort of have you on board. And I was like, yeah, sure. Um, you know, thinking nothing of it. And then his next message was, OK, cool. How much do you charge? And I was like, charge? Interesting. <laughs> you know, I've never been asked this before. And I was like, I, I really just don't know what to say. So, um, you know, I, I went on Google. I was like, how much do consultants charge? And I looked at, you know, the uh, job rate of it is like $40 an hour. I was like, $40 an hour? And he was like, cool, can I book you in for five hours? And I was like, sure. And, um, you know, two years ago, out of nowhere, that's sort of how the journey began. And um, by that time, um, you know, I sort of was doing uh, freelance consulting on the side whilst I was doing um, my roles at uh, Marsh McLennan, uh, so within Marsh and then Mercer, moving into sort of the wealth management sides of things and, and, and understanding the larger deals on the mutual funds, pension funds, and uh, all those uh, risk appetite sides of things. And then as the, you know, the consulting sides of things, you know, grew from one to five to 10, I realized I enjoyed that a bit more. I liked sort of being, you know, rolling my sleeves up and being in that uh, startup ecosystem a lot more uh, decided to you know uh, invest into myself into courses into mentors and, and then yes went all in it's a great start and it's actually funny because you actually you started off in reddit which most people use for i don't know yeah. commenting on politics and football and stuff like that right? exactly yeah yeah, yeah. so it, funnily enough yeah my first three clients were from reddit so you know i, I oh. mean i i i've never used it you know sort of after that just because you know it was very very small ticket but hey if, mm -hmm. if it's not working working out for you on LinkedIn, maybe B2B, try try Reddit, you know, it could work out. There's a lot of cool forums out there. But a, a good uh, product market fit, right? Because <laughs> you literally yeah, exactly. found it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think part of it is um, where a lot of people, and, and just as a sort of a pointer, where a lot of people sort of miss out is providing value first. And I sort of still try to do that now. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's something I picked up from Alex Hormozzi was, you know, too many people are too eager and too early to just go out there and go all sales mode right and start pitching you something and start selling you something um, but that's sort of never been my focus never then never now and um, i know that if i can provide enough value people will just come back to me 
app because you know i'll always keep a gateway open that you know there there are ways to reach out to me whether that be through linkedin or emails or whatever everything is readily available uh, but if i need if i need to give that value for them to come reach out to me because that's always a much stronger lead and people yeah. will stay for much longer whereas you know if you even if you are successful in really sort of being that pushy salesman and you close them the no, chances are you know if, yeah, yeah, yeah they won't last so you know i always prefer to sort of give value first give them something for free give them you know example of what i can possibly do for them and then you know make them come to me alex ramosi is the guy who does gyms right and he always has the the thing on his yeah, nose yeah yeah, like, yeah. Right? you know f fun fact about him he he was actually sued by a gym owner who said he was stealing his content and repurpose in using it uh and then funny enough the alex actually went back to this guy and said actually you stole my content and now you're suing me for using my content that's been on the web for ages now uh so obviously the guy does you know um quit his lawsuit against him because it was like oh so it just goes to show how important it is to add value to people before you even start charging them for it isn't yeah. it yeah, exactly. So you, you mentioned adding value. What about, you know, <clears throat> when you're looking at startups, can you pinpoint some of the red flags they always have? Can you just from the get go say, I don't think this is going to be successful because of A, B and C. And if so, what do they look like? What are these yeah. red flags? I think in terms of due diligence, there's there's really sort of four key things that we look out for. The, mm -hmm. the first thing uh, primarily is product um, in terms of, yeah. you know, how good your product market fit is and you know what problem your product itself is solving and um, you know if you've created a chair that is you know one percent more comfier than what already exists then you know you're not really moving the needle um, and in terms of you know how it sort of fits into the wider market and what the demand for it is right maybe you can create um a really really super tech product uh but if, if it's only solving a problem for like you know five people then again the, the volume really isn't there for an early investor to come in um yeah. the second thing we then look at and is a bit of a red flag is market sizing so calculations of tam sam som is you know it's, it's a very interesting topic because a lot of people don't know how to calculate it and they try and calculate and it's, it's a bit of a it's, it's, it's a bit of a rigorous task to begin with, you know, figuring out what your total addressable market, then your serviceable market, and then your obtainable market is. And people always, you know, they, they misconstrue what obtainable actually is. Um, but, you know, that's the second sort of part where they don't really understand their market. They don't understand who their competition is. And uh, this is this is one of the sort of the, the, the most occurring lines I've seen investors uh, say is, and, and I, would, I would give advice to any of the startups that watch this is, never ever say you don't have any competitors you know you're, you're never the first person to think of the idea maybe it you know something exact into the market doesn't really exist most likely probably does mm -hmm. but if, even if it doesn't you'll still have vertical and horizontal competition the investor yeah. needs to know what's already existing in the market and they need to better understand that market and they need to know that you understand that market um so in the future whether you want to expand horizontally or vertically you'll be able to so that's the second thing um then the third thing is financials uh, and founders who are slightly incompetent of understanding what the valuation of the company is. Uh, one of the things we're seeing a lot in the US domiciled uh, companies is, you know, these, these valuations of 10, 15, 20 million uh, with nothing built and, you know, just an idea. And, and, and you know, ideas are great. Um, you know, I love ideas. You know, I love sort of doing idea brainstorming sessions with my team partners and so on and so forth. But ideas aren't really worth anything themselves it's the execution mm -hmm. so without the execution putting such high and immense value onto something um you know most investors will just you know pass it off so that's the third thing and then the fourth thing is is what we look at is the team itself you know what's the background of the team uh what have the team achieved so so far you know why are they the right fit you know so if, if so you said red flag so you know if a team comes to me and say look we're creating a cyber tech startup but you know none of them have a background in it you know they, they were taxi drivers and you know restaurant owners i was like well how how are you starting you know where, what is your competency um so you need to show that competency there as well so i'll say those four things are the main things we look at it from a due diligence perspective when we're working on the investor side to ensure and, and you know any red flags uh, are mitigated do you think I was actually I've read two things uh, um, complete opposite news. One said that investment has gone down. The other one actually said investment has actually gone up. 
So what do you think the investment market looks looks right now? Because I, I talk to many founders, some say it's really, really hard. Or other people say, actually, no, it's never been better. And if you look at the stats, actually, people are actually putting a lot of money back in. So yeah. what does it look like for you? What's your perspective on this? Yeah, I guess neither are wrong. It just depends on when you compare it to. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you compare it to, you know, peak of 2021, yes, uh, sorry, peak of 2022, end of 2021, yes, investment has gone down. Uh, but if you compare it to Q4 last year, yes, investment has gone up. Um, mm -hmm. So it's your comparison scale uh, in terms of what period in time you're comparing it to. Um, in terms of now, uh, I think we hit a, a, a slump and, you know, we're, we're just coming back in that period now where money is starting to flow in. So Carter does really good reports in terms of the stats um, on pre-seed, seed stage, series A, series B stages funding. You know, Q2, uh, had, which recently just uh, finished, had very minimal incremental increase. I think the average increase was around 1% to 2% um, from the previous quarter. So, yeah, the investment landscape is sort of coming back to what normality was. But so many people came into the entrepreneurial world during or sort of post the pandemic crash. And their understanding of what the market is, is completely flawed. Um, you know, they they thought that, you know, coming into 2021, 2022, early 2022, when everyone had money that, you know, they'll think of something and they'll go to the investor. And investors going to go, here's the money, you know, here's, here's 500 grand. And, you know, you take it, you go invest. That's not really the reality. Um, and now we're coming back, you know, we had the cr crash and it's coming back into market correction phase where good ideas are now being funded again. Investors are starting to sort of take risks um, and the previous investments are now, you know, showing exits. So it, it's coming to that correction phase where probably towards the end of the year or early 2025, we'll see um, it being, you know, maybe not at the peak, but again, sort of on a horizontal um, or, you know, vertical incline. Uh, of some sorts. I think you're the first person who actually has done such a complete analysis of the way the market works and also <laughs> perspective on, on the market. Quite interesting. What do you think? So I'm, I know you do deals in multiple uh, countries and continents, right? We, we were actually talking before that the only two places you haven't done is Antarctica and where's the other one? Uh, Africa, was it Africa? Yeah. Africa. Yeah. So one will be easier than the other, I'm assuming. <laughs> um, but what do you think are... Is it harder to raise in Europe than it is, for example, in the US? Or is it harder to raise in, in Asia? How, how does that actually compare? Even LATAM, to be honest. I don't know much about LATAM. Yeah. So how do they compare? Yeah. Um, in terms of ease of raising, I guess it all sort of depends on competition, right? So the US market makes up roughly 51% of global venture market, like venture and micro PE market. So all of the sort of the, the, the inflow and the money and the deals that are happening in the US us alone rest of the world makes up that amount and so when when sometimes people talk about ease they think oh well you know it'll be so easy but then you also have to look at the number of startups in the same economy because just because there's cash it doesn't mean it's you know easy because then you have to compare it to the volume to, to you know make it easy for people like you know if hundred dollars is being in uh you know invested but there's also 100 people each person is only really yeah. getting one dollar but then, you know, in Spain, if there's $10 being invested, but there's only five people, actually, everyone's getting $2. And, you know, it's, it may be easier because there's less people fighting for that. So, yeah, I, from, from that perspective, uh, I would say U.S. is a very attractive market, uh, especially on the tech. And it, it, it rewards people for taking risk. Um, and as long as, you know, you are credible, you've done something um, and, you know, what you have made is innovative and better for the world, you should be able to get investment. Um, in terms of the European market, European market is, I, I wouldn't put it as European market as a whole because um, London operates very differently to Berlin, which operates very differently to Madrid, which operates very differently um, to, you know, maybe somewhere like Kiev and now and, you know, somewhere maybe like Warsaw. Um, so, so these different economies uh, and maybe Lisbon yourself, I mean, Lisbon's doing quite well, uh, you know, as, as you know. So even these sort of different economies, uh, in Europe sort of play a different part and, and I wouldn't really be able to put them together just because of their different mindsets. Yep. So that's part of sort of Western economy, uh, London being sort of at the peak where they're able to take more risk and are more rewarding. But again, the same volume um, of guys, you know, who are sort of going into it, uh, where the other markets are risk averse. Um, but in terms of how easy it is to raise, it's 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 not that easy to raise an Eastern European economy unless you are a exited founder or you have a really really solid proposition 
Um, and that is getting backed again, sort of by a angel or, or, or a known VC. And then yep. off the back of that, you see uh, a lot of guys coming in. Um, the interesting thing about the Asian and LATAM economies are they're growing. Uh, and a lot of governments um, are putting a lot of money behind it as, uh, you know, plans um, in India, for example. So I know, I know the Indian economy fairly well. Um, you know, with, with, with the uh, Gujarat, in Gujarat, uh, there's a state in India, there's a lot of government investment, you know, they've put in very similar to Dubai, where this is zero uh, corporate tax um, area. Oh, yeah. And, you know, they're inviting sort of companies to come in. It's still rather larger. I think it's, it's four companies who are making more than 50 million in revenue. But that's sort of a way to sort of bring in, you know, these SMEs or MSMEs. Um, so, so, you know, those sort of company, those sort of countries, they're investing a lot, even publicly and privately into their mm -hmm. infrastructure. And same with LATAM, um, you know, Mexico is doing really, really well. Um, as well as Colombia. I know Mexico is Central America before people, you know, come to me and they're like, yeah. <laughs> but like I, I still count it as that, you know, part of LATAM. Um, it's yeah. very different to the US economy. Uh, but Mexico is doing really well. Colombia is doing really well. Brazil always has been doing well. Um, and now, you know, the other Spanish speaking countries around it are trying to sort of play catch up. But it's in those two geographies, it's the involvement from the public sector uh, and, you know, actively opening incubation centers as well as, uh, you know, giving out more subsidies, giving out more grants, giving out more opportunities. Um, it's, it's shaping the landscape in a very, uh, very well manner. And, you know, when, when you talk with all these investors, do they ever, are they ever wary of doing, of having a startup doing business in other, other countries or other regions because of the legal system, for example? And some people might say, you know what? I get the UK legal system, but if I move over, let's take Spain as an example, I don't actually understand how it fully works. So I'm not, I'm not willing to put my money there because I might get, you know, hurt. Does that ever happen? Yeah, no, definitely. There, there are a lot of investors who are like, you know, I'm, I'm UK through and through, or I'm Spain through and through. Most of the time you wouldn't see small ticket angels. And when I mean small ticket, any, anyone investing between sort of 25 to 100K themselves. Yep. taking those big risks unless the company itself has a subsidiary in the other geography. So I know some Spanish companies who have an office in, uh, in England and then have an office in Spain. And the investor will say, cool, because you have an office here, you, you know, you're part English, part Spanish, I'll sort of jump on board. Um, mm -hmm. But, but I, can, I can completely understand that because, you know, it's a different language, it's different sort of judicial system. Spain is, uh, like I sort of said, regulate, regulatory quite tight uh, in terms of how you can set up your accounts, how you can set up um, your laws restriction, it, well, tighter compared to the UK anyways. Um, so, you know, th there is that habit of it. And, and, you know, investor in the UK doesn't speak Spanish, then there's also that aspect of it. And, um, you know, on the on the earlier side, and this is what I sort of tend to focus on um, now for being in syndicates is what value can I add if I couldn't add anything monetarily? And um, that's the biggest mm -hmm. thing I think about, because Cool, you know, you might get 50K, 60K, 100K, whatever. But if I can make those right connections, if I can put the right systems, the right tools in place, that should be ideally worth a lot more than the money because the money will, you know, in the startup ecosystem, 50K, 100K is not a big check. Like, you know, that, yeah. that, you know, some companies will blow that within two months, um, right? So from an investor's perspective, they need to focus more on what connections can we make and what we can do for the startup, which is going to be worth a lot more than just the cash they put in. And if that isn't something they can, I would personally not go into that deal very early on if you're a business angel. If you are obviously the super angel with hundreds of millions behind your back and you know you, you don't mind, then that's fair enough. But if you're sort of an earlier angel and you're sort of looking to go into a different geography, understand the culture, understand what you can bring to the table, understand what you can do aside from your money. And... Yeah. If you can't, you know, if those don't add up, if two and two doesn't equal four there, then, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend it. You mentioned syndicates. Um, so I know you're part of a couple. Can, can you tell the audience how the, does that actually work? And most importantly, should they just reach out to someone in the syndicate saying, hey, can I get some money? Uh, how, how does that actually work? Yeah. So syndication is, is uh, I guess, it, it, it's a bunch of angels uh, or sort of people with money uh, coming together and saying, look, we'll invest as a group. Usually how the main differentiation between a fund and a syndication looks like is with funds, there's an LP and a GP structure. So it's a limited partner and a general partner. And mm -hmm. limited partners, they will put money into a pot 
uh, I'm just visualizing it as a, in a pot. Uh, and the general partner will have, um, in, in very layman's term, the ability to just spend the money as, you know, has been agreed as part of the contract of them signing in. So the money is a bit more readily available, you know, when the startup goes through the due diligence process um, and it's, you know, cleared all the uh, sort of the challenges and due diligences and it meets all the criteria. The the fund manager can just say, look, cool, you fit, you know, here's, here's a check for 200,000. It's a bit different in syndicates where there's groups of angels in a in a, a syndicate not everyone will come in on a deal it's very much on case by case basis so once the syndicate leads brings in uh, a startup or a project we will come in and discuss okay well this is a, a startup this is how much allocation we have who's in more so kind of thing and you know people can then put in you know let's say 10 investors put in 20 grand checks um, uh, out of 100 investors and they'll come yep. in and, and what's set up is called an SPV, which is a special purpose vehicle. And using that, um, you know, we will fund around. So we will sit on the cap table um, as a SPV, which is sort of an entity itself. And that will sort of carry it. So, so that's the sort of the main difference. Um, the, sometimes the, the, the good thing with the uh, syndicates is it's a lot more quicker in terms of hearing the yes or no VCs, they have to go through the committee. I mean, there, there is also an investment committee in the syndicate, but in VCs a lot more sort of formalized. So you have to wait for their decision. You have to go through multiple rounds of due diligences. Uh, and then once it's cleared, then, you know, processing and getting money into the bank, it, you know, sometimes can take three, four, five months. Uh, whereas syndicates are a lot more sort of quick moving where they're like, yay, nay, in, out, cool. This is the amount of allocation we can do. Five people in, money in, money out. And, and you know, it's that part of it. Uh, but then it's also you don't know how much money you're going to be getting uh, with the syndicate because, you know, in one deal, a lot of people might come in and in, in another, you know, not many, you know, many might pull out. Um, so I'll say those are sort of the key differences uh, between a syndicate and a regular fund that most people know. Of. And how, how do you approach them? Because I'm assuming you can really approach them in the same way, especially a syndicate when it has so many decision makers, where mm -hmm. I guess an investment fund will have just one and you kind of know, okay, here's the GP, let me go and uh, introduce myself. So how, how do you even get started with all this? Yeah. I think in any ways, uh, the best way to sort of approach someone is in person or through a contact. Um, I mean, look, we, we all get, you know, spammed on LinkedIn with like, you know, yeah. uh, pitch decks and then, you know, people sort of doing that. So I would say definitely don't do that. I would say that's what, what not to do. Um, you know, mm -hmm. the, the first message from you I don't want to see is, hey, my name is Bob and, you know, this is my startup. This is what I'm raising. And I'm like, oh, mate, just, you know, stop doing Pretend, you know, we're meeting in public, right? You're not just going to yeah. go try and sell me everything the first time you meet someone. You, you, you know, you just give them bad taste. Um, so I would say ideally, if you can go through either someone, you know, so for example, if I'm in that syndicate and, you know, you know, a startup, uh, who might be a fit. So they might come through you and say, Hey, Ricardo, I know, you know, Anbo, can you please have a chat with him and see if he's open to a email exchange? I really want to talk to him about X, Y, and Z. That's yeah. a great way. I go to a lot of events, you know, a, a lot of times that's maybe once a week in some cases. Um, so you'll see me there come up to me then because at that point i'm ready to be pitched because i'm, I'm yep. going to an event uh, especially if it's a networking event about startups about investment at that point i'm expected to be pitched and um, so mm -hmm. at that point you know you can sort of come to me and say look this is what I'll, this is what we're doing you know can we be approached there are ways to do it on linkedin uh, and and our syndicates and then i know a lot of them as well they just have a link underneath so it's it's very similar to a lot of vcs have as well you can fill the form you can you know put your sort of name in and and you know tell us a bit about your startup and if we think it's a fit and you know we like it we'll you know we'll reach out so that that sort of standard form filling procedure exists with everyone and um, so you know if they if they want to reach out to us through that they can do that as well even on linkedin there's a way to build a relationship you know you know offer something of value offer something of diligence that we would be interested in um, and then through that you know if we're on a call then you know later down the line you're like hey look this is the idea i'm working on this is what i've developed do you mind talking to your syndicate partners regarding this? And then you know, the person will be mm -hmm. like, yeah, cool. One. You actually, you, you touch upon this topic twice, which I find quite interesting because that's something I try to do. It doesn't mean it always works or it yeah. always pays out, but I think we end up doing it regardless, which is offer value before you even start asking for anything in return, right? And you know, if if people see it as valuable, they will give you something in return. If they don't see mm -hmm. it as valuable, you're just being a nice guy, you help out a couple of people, right? It yeah. doesn't doesn't hurt to do it anyways, right? Exactly. So, uh, but it's how do you 
how do you stop as an individual and say, I've offered too much free value. It's time for me to start charging for the value I offer. So when, when do you actually make that decision? Yeah, I think, I think it's interesting and it's different for each person, their, their sort of threshold. And for me, when I when when things really changed for me, uh, was when I realized I could offer things that are of value, which my competition charges for um, and still be fine with it. So one of the things um, that I did, and I can talk from my perspective here, you know, in, in Venture Builder, one of the things, like I said, we do is helping startups fundraise, right? And one of the things with fundraisers, you need lists of investors, you need their details, um, you know, you need to know where the investors base, how much they invest, um, you know, so you can sort of figure out uh, and end their past investment. So you can figure out, okay, who can I reach to? Where can I make the connection? How do I sort of stop, you know, nurturing that um, relationship? And a lot of um, consultants or a lot of sort of agencies or a lot of sort of brands, they will charge for those mega lists uh, and fairly so, you know, I, I don't have any issue with them. You know, if they've spent the time in creating that list and, you know, they want to charge five, six hundred dollars for it, fair enough. But I realized, you know, these these lists were super, super popular. You know, they were getting thousands of comments and likes um, yeah. and, you know, people would be interested in buying it and a lot of would buy it. And I, and I was like, I, and again, I listened to Alex Hermosi and I was like, what if I give this for free? What, what if the, you know, one of the biggest things my competition does, what if I do that for free? How would that look like? And, 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 you know, that's when things really sort of change and people were like, how the hell is he, you know, offering? And I, and I would really just buy out these, these lists for, you know, three, three, four hundred dollars or I'd spend a lot of um, money on softwares and curate these lists. And I'd be like, have it for free. You know, and people were like, what is he doing? You know, I had a few messages from a few guys. It was like, you know, I, I think um, this guy who was selling about 2,500 uh, investor list. And, uh, you know, I think I purchased it for about, I can't remember the exact pricing. It was four or $500. And, um, you know, his list, I took it and I just put it on LinkedIn for free. He's like, you can't do that. I was like, why can't I? You know, I, I've, bought the, I've bought the list. Um, and, you know, I can, I can do whatever the hell I want with the list now. Um, like, well, yeah, but you're giving the, you're giving it for free. Like, you know, at least at least put something on it. And I was like, well, you know, I I I, I don't wish to. And 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 for mm. me, you know, that was enough value giving out for free. Whereas for him, it wasn't. So that that's sort yeah. of why I mentioned about threshold. But for me, it was like, you know, I could spend the same amount on ads and not get enough conversion. So for me, it was okay to give out all of that value and not get anything back. I was already fine with that level mm -hmm. because, you know, at, at, at that early sort of stage, I wasn't growing. It was very sort of slow, minimal growth. So I was okay with that. Um, so the finding out this new technique was very much like, if it works, awesome. If it doesn't work, that's fine. I'll, I'm, I'm okay with that threshold. And um, so you need to sort of set up that perception and that threshold of like, okay, how much am I okay with? Am I okay with speaking to someone completely uh, and them not being able to repay me in any sort of way or do i you know want do i want to safeguard something you know you, you need to set that barrier for yourself and i think as you grow as you get bigger and bigger your that that threshold gets higher and higher so you know yeah. maybe two years ago when i was starting i would never been able to do it one because it was expensive and second i was like you know, I don't have that much value to give as an individual or as a company. So I need to, I need to hold into as, I need to hold off as much information, but now I'm like, fine, you know, even if they don't come to me, that's, that's okay. I've still given them something um, that is of, you know, value. Yeah, yeah. So I would say that that level changes there. Uh, and in terms of what else they can do to, to figure out where that level is, uh, look at what the competition is doing. Right. And just be that one step ahead um, because, you know, the competition might be doing 90 not, and, and, and there's this funny calculation in maths. You know, it's like one times 0 0.99 will always be less than one. But, you know, if you can go to one just over that or 101, you know, it will incrementally go so much higher. Um, so just just try and make that threshold a little bit ahead uh, of what the existence is. Interesting. It's funny you mentioned um, investor lists, and I think a lot of startups are always looking out. Ooh, how do I find this email and that email? But the reality is, it's not hard to find the emails. It's no, it's hard to engage in a proper conversation with people. Yeah, that's what I find. Because you, you can send them everyone. Like you can send twenty five thousand cold emails. That doesn't mean they're gonna invest in you. Yeah. But if you take your time to actually say, you know what, I got this email. Let me go and see what this person invests in, and actually yeah. make a nice conversation afterwards. Then you're much more likely to, be, to have yeah. some. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Oh, you mentioned, you know, Alex. I'm curious on what mentors you have. Like, who do you look up for and uh, out for? Um, I mean, who are your mentors? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I used to have a mentor about two years ago, um, and he was a gentleman based out of the US. He, he, you know, he sort of ran a few recruitment and tax agencies and, and done well um, in business, but he, he wasn't really on the tech side, um, sort of startup mm -hmm. side, but, you know, he, he'd done really, really well, eight figure plus. Um, and, you know, I spoke to him in my early sort of days um, whilst, you know, I stayed in the US for a month or so, um, understanding a bit more about the basics of business. In terms of now, um, I don't have any mentors currently, but I think, yeah, I think Alex is one that I look up to quite a lot just because, again, he, he just gives out so much value for free. And, you know, so much of his principles come from this is what I did and this is what you can take away from that. You know, and, yeah. and I like that perspective because it's not that you should do this. Well, why should I, you know, because that, that, that's what people, you know, think where, you know, when someone is telling them to do something, it's like, but when it comes from a perspective of this is what I did and this was the result, it's a lot more trusting and comforting in the fact that a person is telling from their own perspective and these were the results he got himself. So he does, you know, he doesn't need to make something up. You know, people can see all of the accounts. He's very transparent. Um, and there's a lot of sort of stuff that, you know, he's applied, whether that's worked or hasn't worked. So he, he's one individual I look up a lot to. And um, Cody Sanchez is another one uh, where, yep. you know, she started off quite small uh, and now has bring, brought up a very reputable brand um, of, you know, buying and selling businesses and sort of um, yep. PE activities and venture activities. Um, and there's other sort of few individuals, uh, you know, whose newsletters and stuff I would read and, and sort of try and um you know stay up to date well but you know those those two are sort of big and, and because now i'm sort of focusing a lot on branding side of things as well as as a individual you know animal itself rather than just gax you know i i i i, I i'm trying to not se separate it but i understand mm -hmm. that gax is the part of uh me but not me on its own so i'm, I'm focusing yeah. on that aspect and you know these two guys have done that really really well uh, so those two are probably the ones I look up to. I completely get the personal branding because I'm incredibly shy, as you probably noticed by now. But uh, the fun thing is I most most of the things I do, people don't realize it's me doing them. So I go and introduce mm -hmm. myself, you know, for example, my events. I go, hey, I'm Ricardo. I'm one of the organizers here. And like, oh, oh, you, oh, so you ran this. Yes, that's literally, you know, it's my company. Me and, you know, mine's in Harry. Like, oh, OK, we had no idea who you guys were. Because both of us never do any proper branding. And I think yeah. that's something definitely to start working on is like how to sell myself a little bit better online. Because it's always it's always a fine line between you sounding incredibly cocky and arrogant mm -hmm. and you realizing you're doing it to just saying, you know what, I'm just wanna, I am just want just want to share the world uh, to the world who I am, right? And so it's, yeah. a, it's a tricky exercise. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, uh, and, and I guess, you know, for some people, they don't want to do it. And that, that's completely fine. You know, there's those people who are very happy just you know, working from the shadows and mm -hmm. it, it works for them and, and that's great. Yeah. But for me, I realized I wanted to be more than just a owner of a company. Um, you know, I wanted yeah. to sort of be known as that young entrepreneur who's doing something, um, you know, different, who's, who's sort of stirring and making waves. And, and I realized I couldn't do that just as the CEO and founder of Gax. I had to do that as Anmol. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, Part of that is, you know, building up that brand. And, you know, I, I'm still very early days. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a bit of big uh, social media guy. So I've had to sort of bring someone in. And um, even though I'm young, you know, I still feel like a boomer. I'm always asking questions regarding how do you do this on Instagram? What, what does this mean? What, what, does, what do you do, with, you know, on TikTok? So, yeah, I'm, I'm still figuring that part out. I feel your pain. I, like My Instagram etiquette, I always double check. Like, is it OK for me to follow someone if I just <laughs> met them? Is that all right? Oh, even though I've been to their house multiple times and they've been to my house multiple times, is it still okay for me to follow them on Instagram? And be like, yes, of course, it's perfectly normal. Oh, okay, all right. I thought you need to be really, really close friends. So it's stuff like that that I'm still, I really struggle with. But yeah, yeah, that's all. One very interesting question, at least for me, is what is the latest book you've read? Oh, interesting. Um, the most recent one, I think, was Atomic Habits. Um, I'm not done mm -hmm. with it uh, and I've, I've, I've just started it. Um, I'm one of those people uh, who don't read, who like to listen to books, um, just I'm because I'm, I'm, I'm too ADHD to just sit down and read. Um, so there's this app called Audible, um, I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. you already know, um, yeah, which yeah. you, know, you can just you know, put in and, and listen to books. So anytime I'm on the way to the gym or I'm on the tube or I'm traveling somewhere, I'm in the plane or something, I'll just put that in and I'll just listen to it. Um, and you can save like notes on it. So like 
little you know chunks of uh, voice clips um, where it says a sentence which is really really good so one is atomic habit um and the last one um i was reading uh which one was it um uh, i think it was 48 laws of power or something i, I, I can't remember the yep. exact name yeah By Robert um Green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that was th those those two other sort of the most recent reads or uh, listens, I would say. Interesting. Um, Emil, if people want to reach out to you, how can they do so? Yeah, um, I would say the easiest way is LinkedIn. Uh, reach out to me through that. Um, you know, my name's Anmol Goyle. Um, so if, you know they 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 want to put that in my face and and reach out through that, connect with me. Uh, I'm quite active there. Um, or you know, if, if you see me at an event. Feel free to you know come in person, talk to me about yourself. Maybe Instagram as well. Uh, I'm now trying <laughs> to build that uh, brand, so you know maybe you guys sort of can be the first ones who start reaching out to me through that. I'm still very early days with it, and that's the animal dot goyle. So if you want to reach out there as well, you can okay. do that. All right, definitely, uh, animal. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed the conversation. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me.